Helmet out, Cup. Helmet out, Cup. Let Julian Baroner in watch out, Pillow. No, Chante was staying up at Choose Up Pillow. My name is Julian Baroner. I'm the current president for the Oglala Sioux Tribe of the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota. The second youngest president to ever uh, hold office um, in the history of my tribe. Um, I was bestowed an honor today um, to introduce our first candidate. Um, as a veteran of the United States Army, you know, I, I sat and pondered about this introduction this morning, and I reflected back at the history that Native Americans have in serving in the armed forces. You know, the highest enlistment rate of any ethnic group to ever serve this country is us, the Native Americans. You know, and reflecting back on our code talkers who helped to establish this country and set a solid foundation for the generations yet to come. You know, and without their service and their sacrifice and without our traditional language, you know, the wars, the war may have been lost and we wouldn't be able to stand here today. So this morning, you know, when I woke up, I prayed because I know the Navajo Nation and my heart and my condolences go out to the Navajo Nation as they mourn the loss of another one of their code talkers that has made their journey across to the spirit world. So with that, you know, I, it's, it's my duty and my honor to introduce our next candidate who is a retired military officer, uh, served in the United States Navy, um, ranking of a, a three-star admiral, Mr. Joe Sestak of Pennsylvania, a 2020 candidate for the President of the United States. <clears throat> so with that, um, I would like to welcome this gentleman, you know, to address my relatives, to address my people. And, you know, and I ask the people to keep your hearts and your minds open and to listen very well to the questions that are going to be asked here today and, and to really give an in-depth decision and to the young people that think that, you know, it is impossible to stand in my shoes, that it is not impossible. But it takes your voice and, and your vote you know, to make an informed decision on who you want to serve as your elected official. So with that, I want to say, Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. I'm Joe Sestak, and I'm very taken that I have this opportunity with you. What I'd like to do, if it's all right, is just spend about two minutes of a brief bio here, tell a short story that will take us into the policies I wanted to discuss, having to do with the Native American community, and then sit down and take the best part questions and answers. I'm Joe Sestak, and I did wear the cloth of our country for over 31 years, in war and in peace. On the ground in Afghanistan, heading the Navy's anti-terrorism strategic unit for a brief period at the beginning of the war. And then I came out and took command of an aircraft carrier battle group for the strikes against Afghanistan. When ashore, I'd be assigned to different positions, such as working for President Clinton as his director of defense policy, trying to bring together all the elements of our power in one cohesive whole. But then, at about my 31st year, my then four-year-old daughter got brain cancer. So sitting down beside her, retired, she recovered because of the wonderful health care plan that this nation gave us in the military. And so my payback, my accountability to my country, was to go back to where I grew up in a nearly two-to-one Republican district, changed from independent to Democrat, and became the second Democrat 
since the Civil War in that district. Reelected two years later by 20 points. I didn't spend a penny of the three million dollars that I had raised on a single campaign ad. Somehow, even as I stood with my progressive values, we learned to disagree well. But also, I also sometimes stood up when I thought my party was wrong, such as when a senator who was a Republican, Senator Arlen Specter, some of you may remember, had tried to humiliate a woman, Anita Hill, during the hearings which she had brought forward allegations of sexual harassment against now Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. And when he wanted to switch parties a few decades later, I remembered my six sisters. And so I did oppose our wonderful president on down who embraced him, but ran against my party's desires in the Senate race from 40 points down to win because the people, Republicans and Democrats of my state agreed. Now we're losing the general election, I then went home. But my daughter's brain cancer came back last year. Never thinking I'd get into this presidential race, it's because of sitting with her that I once again entered this contest. And so after that short bio, if I could tell a story of why I believe this nation truly wants one thing and why I, how I look at the issues that affect and have been neglected too long in the Native American community. Come aboard an aircraft carrier with me just for a moment. There's 5,000 sailors. You could ask Mr. Siemens. He served on a carrier, the Hancock. I had the George Washington. There's 5,000 sailors. Their average age is 19 and a half. They run a nuclear reactor. They fix that plane before you get in, and no one asks the question. They just know, whomever they are, that they did it right. If anybody doesn't think the youth of America aren't great, you should see them perform there. The pilot turns on his or her engine. They strap a bar from the belly of the plane into the catapult underneath. They push a button, and that catapult flings you into the night. Walt Disney doesn't have a better ride than that. But sometimes, in the middle of the night, they'll say, shut down your engines. There's been an ambush in Afghanistan. They need a different type of plane. But no pilot will turn off his or her engine until they know they have been unhooked from that bar, from that catapult. Because if you turn off your engines and suddenly someone makes a mistake and pushes that button, you go off for a wonderful ride. But without your engines turning, it's the final one of your life. And so the entire flight deck freezes until a young 19 and a half old youth, could be from Pennsylvania, could be from Iowa, could be from a red state, could be from a blue state. We just don't care. And that youth goes under the belly of the plane and hooks it from the catapult. And then, because the pilot can't see that young sailor, they don't go to the side of the plane and look up and give a signal. Rather, they walk in front of that plane. And they look up at the pilot and give a simple signal like this. And then that youth of America shows what this country most yearns for by remaining there until that pilot shuts off his or her engine, opened up the canopy of their plane, and gotten safely on deck. And by standing there, they have said, go ahead, you can trust me, not for my word, but for my deed. And if, after you turn off your engines, before you're on the deck, if I made a mistake, you're going right through me, and I'm going overboard with you to my own. I have found few people who have thought anyone in Washington, D.C. would stand in front of that plane for them. It's why I'm running for president, but it's also what has happened far too much with this lack of accountability for the deed not the word, not the intention, but the actual deed to the Native American community. Take jurisdiction.
Pride is a sovereign nation. And when treaties were made or changed, they deal with the United States of America as an equal. When I'm on a Navy ship overseas and I walk off into the United Arab Emirates or into Nigeria, into an overseas sovereign country, I am under the country's jurisdiction. If arrested, I am under their judicial system. There might be a status of forces agreement that tries to make sure if both countries agree that that sailor arrested is treated fairly. But if not, that country is the one that handles the jurisdiction and the judicial proceedings of the sailor of America, a different sovereign country. But if I walk on to Pine Ridge, commit a crime, the chances are that because of jurisdictional conflict, I won't be prosecuted for it. Why? 80%, as people know, of all sex crimes on a reservation are committed by a non-Native American man. It's wrong, and it should be changed that that sovereign nation and its laws and its courts should not handle the crime committed in its sovereign territory. You can take also this issue of accountability or the lack thereof in that instance of jurisdiction into violent sex crimes. We all know that there is no accountability for the hundreds, yet thousands, of missing or murdered women or girls of the Native American community. We don't even have the data of how many there are. Also, someone in 2016 said there was about 5,000. Where is that data? In the military, you learn you can expect what you inspect. And so we actually have a sexual trauma issue in the Navy, in the military. If you look each year, though, there is a database that is built up to find that the trend is going like this. So we should know how to act, where to go, who to prosecute, how to intervene and hold those individuals accountable. We aren't doing it yet in the military, which is why I believe, whether legislatively or however it has to be done, this data must be mandated to be collected, to be savored, to look through it, and to find out what's occurring and why. As Napoleon said once, if I were to be in love, I would analyze it bit by bit because I can't ask how or why enough. Why isn't this country outraged and trying to find out how or why? And then go to the next step, which we aren't quite doing in the military. Make sure you fund properly those courts, those police, and those prosecutors. I will end with one last example because I think you want to get to the questions. But if I could, I have been to marginalized communities throughout this world, over 80 countries. I have seen in those 80 countries, some of them, specifically in Africa, having gone through traumatic times as a Western colonial system was imposed upon it, creating traumatic and shattered communities to where even governance is not passed from one generation to the other, to where relationships break. It is not unlike what we have done, and we must accept it as these, that to the Native American community before we begin to even take the next step, which is fully fix those problems. Thank you very much. Thank you and good morning. Uh, we'll jump right into it, and we'll start with uh, Janet Davis from uh, Pyramid Lake. 
Good morning, everyone. It's an honor to be here to speak with you this morning, sir. Um, my question is about food sovereignty and national security. With the uh, recent trade wars affecting our farms and agriculture, combined with climate change creating dramatically different weather patterns for our farmers, we are concerned about the long-term security of our national food productions. Our communities have long advocated for the incorporation of traditional indigenous plants and growing practices to help and sustain our national food supply. How do you think food sovereignty can strengthen our national security and how will you support these efforts from the White House? Yes, um, there's several ways. First, up until about three or four decades ago, the United States government was the one that ensured there was thousands of all different types of seedlings. We used to work with land, land grant campuses like Iowa's, like Penn State, and it ensured that there was thousands of varieties for whatever condition might ensue. And then a few decades ago, we stopped. We let the land grant universities go along with license to corporations and develop it. So here you can have essentially 80% of all uh, uh, corn acreage and 90% of all soybean acreages with one particular seedling that's going down that the farmer is not even allowed to replant. And so when climate change occurs, we are going to have a serious problem because some of it is going to occur. And we have not continued the, that development of seed, different seedlings for that. So I have proposed on my website that what we really need to do is reopen the government intervention in this to make sure that we can continue that type of nutritious type of different hybrid. So you don't, you have the right seedlings that can grow when it becomes a little warmer here than normal. Second, we truly have to change to a more organic, regenerative, non-tillage type of farming. The United Nations just came out with a report, and it said worldwide we have to do this. Because as you well know, as we tillage these now increasingly large farms, we're over 36% or more than 2,000 acres, where before only about 15% were over, you know, were that large. And we get bigger and bigger with the monopolization of our farmlands. We are harming the environment as well as the soil by the constant annual tillage. And so we have to go back, and I have proposed a land, a kind of like a, uh, it's called a, a, far, a farm a trust uh, bank to where we would give to the marginalized communities those types of acreage, like I just passed one the other day, that have been abandoned or in foreclosures, and before the large corporations suck them up, to be able to give a loan so that the marginalized communities can purchase it and under a seven-year agreement, they then move towards this type of farming. There's several other things, but those were two that I think can help to do it. But I will say this, even if we were to institute the Green New Deal, which would, and even if we were to achieve it in one decade, it won't matter unless we convene the rest of the world to do something. 85% of all greenhouse emissions come from overseas. Only 8% of the world, of the tropics, has air conditioning. But 50% will have air conditioning by 2050. And unless we sign the Kigali Agreement and ratify it, we have signed it and ratified it, which has to do with hydrofluorocarbons, but also then enforce that you must have, by convening the world in the Climate Change Agreement, that you must use the best air conditioning efficiency today if they use the average one, that will be equal equivalent to deforesting two-thirds of the Amazon. This is one where America must convene the world to protect us here at home in climate change. Our next question comes from Lester Thompson from Crow Creek. Good morning. Again, to the elders that I'm speaking from before today, I ask for your forgiveness. It is an honor, and I'm humbled to be here. To you, sir, I have read your, full, your profile. And looking at your profile, you are a man of long history of structure, 
and accountability. You emphasized that in your opening speech. I'm going to touch on two subjects overall. Uh, I'll start out with the question put before me. The suicide rate is up 139% for Native American women and 71% for Native men since 1999. Young people between the age, ages of 10 and 24 constitute a third of suicide deaths. Nearly a quarter of American Indian people suffer from, P, from PTSD, compared to the only 8% of the U.S. population. Indian South Services provides woeful, inadequate mental health care, and young people in particular suffer from inadequate mental health care infrastructure in Indian country. How will you, under your administration, address mental health care and the alarming rise in suicides rate across Indian country? Now, I'm gonna add in on this because as a, as a tribal leader, I, I have addressed these situations before and, and as a lot of it comes down to this funding and every time we turn around we are we start out with our local service units and they tell us to go to our regionals regional offices regional offices turn around and tell us to go to DC and at each step they tell us to go to lobby for more money and every time we lobby for more, more money there's a little bit given but that money does not reach the bottom line of the services where it's adequately needed and desperately needed. So as a man of accountability and structure, how are you gonna address the inverted pyramid in funding sources throughout Indian Health Services, but not only Indian Health Services, but the Bureau of Indian Affairs structure itself? What was the last three words? The Bureau of Indian Affairs. Um, first off, we have to declare suicide as a public health issue. It is not just in your community, although it's the worst there. But the majority of uh, the veterans uh, is, is just been rising. Uh, in the military, women commit suicide the most with guns, for example. We have to even control, I think it's a public health issue, but we're forbidden under law to have the center CDS centers study this as a public health issue. And we also have to recognize that we have broken our mental health system. There are less psychiatric beds in America today than in 1850. In fact, the largest hospital for psychiatric care is Rikers Prison in New York. So it comes down to two issues. He's absolutely right, resources, but also accountability of enforcement. I sat there next to Senator Kennedy and next to his nephew, Representative Kennedy, on the mental health parity bill when it was passed. And all, all states are supposed to now by law give the same mental health treatments and benefits that you would for a physical illness. So if you need 25 visits for a broken leg, you get 25 visits for mental health. It can be no less. No one, not one state is enforcing it. Not one. Second, part of this not always has to do with drug and alcohol and other types of addiction. We put in sort of in Affordable Care Act that that too had to be on a par with physical health requirements. And that isn't, although it's a less, you know, Affordable Care Act only passed the sum, is not, is not yet uh, enforced either to the same degree it does. So for shortly, I think mental health parity has to be enforced everywhere. As far as the Indian Health Services and others, it does come down, absolutely right, to making sure the money flows from the top all the way down here. The structure is broken. 
there's a lot more being broken. But part of that reason is because you see, I think you mentioned the word lobby, am I wrong? 450 congressmen and senators have taken a lobbying job since 1998. Their income has increased 400% in that period of time where the medium level of income of America for the working family has flatlined. I know. I got offered those jobs. We have to stop the revolving door. And then what you need is to make sure that the proper funding, and I do think you can do what we tried to do with the VA, you do two years of the funding. So it's not waiting year in, year out. And we did this temporarily, I don't think they're still doing it, but we made sure that the funding for the VA is a two-year commitment. And then you just have to watch it go down. There's other things you can do also. Do what Britain does, and these are practical things. The mo when you decide that you're going to do suicide, you have about a 10 minute window that if you don't commit it, you won't do it. So what they do in England, if it's pills, they have them in packages where it'll take 10 minutes to open it, over 10 minutes, literally. Like Tylenol, they just don't come in a big jar. You've got to make sure. It's a very practical thing, but the suicide rates by them just plummeted by drugs. And second, I think you have to have the proper gun control, assault weapons bans, you know, and, and, and others in the background check. But you're right. Mental health is the largest illness we have in America today. And we set up some laws to try to make sure it was right, and they're not being enforced. But if the proper funding were going in, and the best mental health care you can get in this nation, according to a study of RAND or New England Journal of Medicine, is in the VA. It should be the same way, because there's no difference of how Indian Health Services and all are provided. It's very similar, and you know that. And it should be on the same way that they do it, because it's integrated care, and the mental health is there on the front line sitting next to the physical doctor, and that's another way they do it. But it's inadequate here. Not only that, I think the entire population should be in it, not just 2.2 million. And it's an issue on funding. Two years to make that commitment and then watch it go down. I'm sorry I don't have a better answer, but I do aware of the problem, and I think it's a multi-purpose problem. And uh, this lobbying is a major issue. It's a major issue, and I think that's part of the reasons people don't trust Washington, D.C. Is there a follow-on on that one, sir? Our next question comes from Orville Caillou from uh, Omaha Tribe. Can we say one thing? My wife does a suicide study as we speak at the VA, so we watch this carefully. I know what it is. Good morning. I don't, I don't remember, know if you heard my talk about the ECLA problem on our reservation earlier, but it's, you know, we have a... Which problem was it, sir? We have a 400 cases with one or two people working all these cases, and it's, a, it's probably a funding issue, but you know, out, out in Indian country and in, in Texas, there were, there's a judge that said the ICWA Act of 1978 was unconstitutional. Which act is this, sir? I can't, pardon me? Which act is this? Indian Child Welfare okay, Act. Okay, got it, yes, I'm okay. familiar with it, it's yes. ICWA. Yes, sir. Um, what? What measures would you take? What qualifications would you ask for for the judges that hear these cases? Yes, sir. I think we have too few of these courts that were set up under the law. And you know, I think most of them are state. Am I not, am I correct? And what you need to do, you just have too few of them. And the person truly has to be somebody who is, and I don't mean just to use this words, but is empathetic.
to the challenges that parents, often single parents, go through in the Native American community. So because of the exact issue that you raise, suicide also comes from feelings of deprivation, feelings of poverty, addiction, despair, anxiety, which are highly prevalent, prevalent in the Native American community, you need to have someone who actually doesn't just say, take that child away, but is someone who sits there and understands that on a, at least a monthly basis has milestones that you place before the parent and says, here's what you need to do for the next one, and here's what you need to do the next one. If we walk away, from how some of these state courts are doing it properly, and frankly, often with a woman being the judge, to be quite frank, the ones that I've noticed and read about, they tend to be a little more successful. I don't mean to be prejudiced, but I think they take in those things. We're, th that child and that parent won't get you united. They'll just say, it's a problem, and separate them. But what must also be done, which is what you have brought up, there must be additional programs to help that parent for the initial reason you've taken the child away, drug use or whatever, to move on. This nation, particularly with opioids, is suffering. And this is one of the causes why children are taken away. Am I wrong, sir? It's one of many, the opioid does. And so my belief is you have to lock a lot more of these courts so that you don't have to travel the distance to get to them. You need to make sure that there's programs that help the parent get back on track, so to speak, so the child can be more readily reunited. It isn't just you've lost the child. But if I could, on the opioid issue, to your point, in the previous administration, the number two Justice Department official went down to the DEA and told them to stop after pharmaceutical lobbyists came in and pressured him. All investigations and referrals for prosecution of illegal pill mills, where a million pills were being sent to a town in Western Virginia, for example, that had 500 people and a million were being sent per week. 165,000 opioid deaths ensued after that happened. Not all due to that, but many were. And that gentleman went to become a lobbyist. This is a political issue, not just the pharmaceuticals and all, to what your point was. And that's why some parents are losing their children. Our next question comes from Stella Kay, Little Trevor Band. And um, Chimi Gwetch from the people of the land of the Crooked Tree um, for coming here to speak with us today. Thank you for your service, Admiral. Um, veterans are honored throughout Indian country, and we take our obligation to defend our country to heart. In fact, Native Americans serve in the U.S. military in greater numbers than any other group, and we have since the revolution. As you know, Native American veterans are eligible to receive services from both the VA and Indian Health Services. Unfortunately, there is often a lack of communication between the two agencies that lead to more broken promises. To help address this problem, there have been a pro proposals to create MOUs between Indian Health Service and the VA to streamline and provide better access to quality care for net Native veterans, but it hasn't happened yet. When you are president, what will you do to bridge the gap between the VA and Indian Health Services to help these veterans? It would be one of several not just an MOU, a memorandum of agreement, but of actually a welding together of the bureaucracies. Why? The VA, when a per, I visit a prison every year on Veterans Day to visit my vets. Those who came home from Vietnam are sitting there because nobody knew what PTSD was. So as a congressman, I went every year and up until my daughter's brain cancer came back, even after Congress. But yet, when a vet who's in the VA gets sent to prison for some reason, the VA won't even transfer its records to the prison. 
I met down with General Shinsheki, head of the VA, when I left Congress, said if he's legislation trying to change that. That's one more than memorandum of agreement. Number two, the one that you brought up has to be. The third one is when you get out of the military, a lot of people have a, this issue that the VA is all messed up. It's got its problems, but it's been rated by the New England Journal of Medicine and in RAND as beating or tying any private health care provider or Medicare or Medicaid in 11 of indices. That's the VHA, not the VBA, which is the benefit side. So the other memorandum of owned agreement or the union is when you get out of the military, they make that person get a physical, then you got to get another physical at the VA, then you got to go to the benefit side of bureaucracy that's broken. The memorandum of agreement is going to be you get one stop, one physical that provides your discharge and your in charge to the BABA, and you got 60 days to figure out if the VBA is done or not. It's pure and simple, and that's what needs to be, and it's the same way here. And the reason is, is that the VA is now looking at trying to deal with suicides and other issues by trying, they're starting this, all right, by trying to reach out better, and it hasn't happened, but they are talking about, and I just know, of trying to say, look, we can't do it all ourselves. Many of those vets, those 20 suicides a day that we get, they're not in the VA system, they're outside. They've got to go to places like the Indian Health Services and, and work with them. But if you get, and the thing is, if you get in the VA, it's got great mental health and everything like that, but some of them don't want to be in it, and so why can't you join up together? I, I don't say this lightly. I got into Congress for one reason, for health care, and it still is the reason that drove me there. And without proper health care, we lose about $100 billion a year in productivity in this nation. It bothers all of us, harms all of us, just not the individual. And that's how we have to try to attack it. And, but I thank you for bringing that up. I, 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 to be frank with you, I wasn't quite aware as much there was a problem between these two. But yes. It's one more seam. And that's Almost the hardest thing to do, is to get two organizations to well, work together. Almost any organization has a problem working with IHS. It's, they're just, the resources aren't there, the agreements aren't there, we're already underfunded. It, this kind of thing needs to be fixed. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Alex Wisa, Hokagon Band of Potawatomi. That's a Pokagon Band, but nice try. <laughs> Um, Bujo, Minnewaban Admiral, good, uh, greetings and good morning for, in Potawatomi. It's, it's wonderful to have you here. Um, before I get to my question, I wanted to say uh, I was impressed uh, in your opening remarks when you said you had visited 80 countries. I hope that you'll commit in your bid for the White House to, to visiting at least 80 tribal nations here in the United States. I'd love to hold town halls. Thank you. <laughs> good on you. Thank you. Um, so. Uh, in a neighboring state to Pennsylvania, I live in Ohio, and I serve on the state's Historic Preservation uh, Advisory Board. And I'm the only Native person that, that serves on this state-appointed board. So um, the environment and sacred sites come up quite often. So I appreciate the position you have taken to restoring uh, the Black Hills. And um, for some reason, uh, Americans or non-natives honor the sacredness of man-made structures more than, uh, or not as always as much, the sacredness of creator-made structures. We've seen this in Standing Rock, and it's happening right now in Hawaii. So I'm wondering as president, how will you ensure sacred sites are protected and tribes are consulted prior to any development? Yes, and I don't see that lightly. I think whether it's the uh, how close the XL, uh, the, um, the pipeline. Yeah, what is it? I forgot. Keystone. Keystone pipe, XL pipeline, which I opposed, I mean, publicly before, even though I wasn't in office, I was just running for it at the second, my second race. Um, how close it comes in butts or the damage that it can do as it drains, you know, crosses rivers and all. But you take Beer's Ears, okay? There's another area where there are sacred places. We have to be prepared in this nation to say, much like we do for physical places of mosques, synagogues, or churches, 
that these Native American places are a sacrosanct. Nor can you have, as they did in the Armed Services Committee authorization bill, moving trading federal prop property as, as though nobody would notice it, you know, where they trade for what really belongs to a sovereign nation and shifts it over here. But yes, I believe wholeheartedly that they are sacrosanct and not open to developments. And normally, most of that development tends to be, well, some are minerals, but some of them tend to be like the pipeline, where we can't be doing that <coughs> anyway, if we really are sincere about doing climate change. Thank you very much. Our next question Chuck, comes. Chuck um, Canyon's another example. Um, Chuko, Chuko, if I mispronounce it, thank you. Next question comes from Asa Washins from uh, Native Organizers Alliance. Shach Maitsky, Naimuma, one next is Tilo Uh Good morning, uh, Admiral. It's always good to meet another veteran. Um, I'm from the Yakima Nation. And so uh, my question is, is, around, is around the census, right? And census. You, they have the census. And so you understand that data is important. You know, um, with up, upcoming census, it's even more important for this country. Um, the census distributes about $800 billion annually through, you know, through all the federal funding that it does. Um, and Indian country has been identified as historically undercounted communities uh, just because of the low response rates from previous surveys. And so with that in mind, uh, Admiral, um, there, are many there are many challenges to the 2020 census as, as they roll out the survey. Um, and, and that's mainly from the current administration. They, you know, they're, they're kind of hoping for an undercount. I mean, that's what I think. And so how would you, when you take office, what, what is your response to that? And how will you ensure tribes and tribal communities will receive adequate funding based on incorrect, incomplete data. Yeah, and if they've done the census incorrectly, you're saying. Like, yeah, so the whole issue here is, it's very simple, I think, is the Constitution says people. It doesn't say citizens. It says people. And so if they are underfunding, and there's two different ways the census has in order to deal with under, uh, underfunding, undercounting, all right? One is a massive, as you said, another, it's almost another survey that they do to try to do stuff. And then they have another mechanism, algorithm that they use, as I, as I remember, this is like two, three years old, my reading on it, to understand this issue. But my belief is that, first off, if this census is held correctly, and they're fighting it again, then I think that, and it's, that we can, I can't promise it's gonna get through, but I have no problem whatsoever saying what would it have been and trying to reallocate funding for that. My belief is and my hope is that this census will be correctly done, and if it is correctly done, then the funding is how it comes out. Am I answering your question? Yeah. Okay, I just want to make sure because you watch this very closely, and I'm glad you brought this up because frankly, I know this is a large issue for the Hispanic community, for example, but it also gets you right here. And uh, I didn't know it was as enormous an issue for you, is it? Yeah, um, in, in the 2010 census, um, one report says that Indian country is undercounted by almost 5%, which is huge. Which the, the Native Americans undercount 5%. Almost 5%. 5%. And we'll see, afterwards, the Census Bureau, at least my remembrance is, steps back and then they do this test of everything that comes in to see if it was undercounted. So I will look at that, all right? Because if that showed that it was 5% undercounted, then you just have to correct the census. And they're supposed to be accountable of making sure you just don't take everything in. There's a double check back here by statistics to see did you, did, did, does it look flawed by the analysis that you step back and do another, just like a, taking a poll just, but you're doing it with the numbers that came in of what it might have been. That's my memory on this. But I, if it is wrong by that, then I think you have to go and just correct it and the money gets allocated correctly. Do you know who did the study? It was the government, correct? Uh, the, the, the study that we, that I read was from um, uh, Indian Country Today and through NCEI. 
All right, if I could talk to you afterwards to get that, I mean, the thing, or just to make sure I write that down. But the government itself is supposed to do this kind of back check upon how well the census was conducted. Thank you, Admiral. Thank you. And our next question comes from Jarrett Work, also representing Native Organizers Alliance. Hello, thank you. Uh, my name is Jarrett Work. I'm uh, Ani from the Fort Belknap Reservation in Montana, home of the uh, Ani and Nakota people. Uh, thank you for coming here, and thank you for being here. Uh, so um, my question is about the representation and media. So I've come to find the importance of representation within the media, especially within Indian country. Indian country is lucky and privileged to have the many extremely talented and dedicated Native journalists covering the issues and stories within our communities. Many of them are here today covering this historical event. However, the Native voice is often left out or not heard in mainstream media. Our stories are not often covered and issued not considered due to the lack of representation within the mainstream media. If and when Native issues do make national news, it's often misreported on because they don't understand Native history or federal Indian law. I believe it's important for the next president to bring in the expertise that Indian country has in terms of journalism and reporting. It's important for Natives to exercise our First Amendment right and to have that seat at the table to be able to ask these questions that directly impact our communities. So my question to you is, if you become president, how would you create spaces for indigenous journalists and native media to be at all White House press briefings and other media gatherings? And how will your administration's transparency be inclusive to native media? Um, good question, but I also think it ties into your comment of inviting me at places. Um, I believe a president, like the captain of a ship, by where he goes and what he does, sets a tone. So if all of a sudden you have a president visiting 80, all of a sudden people start paying attention. I, and I mean that. I mean, my first day I'm gonna hold a town hall in the middle of America, you know? And, and then I expect to keep holding them in various places. But that's one way. The second way is to mandate that there are to be access in billets, positions in the White House journalist. But the other way is to reinstitute that summit that was held every year at the White House and is no longer being done uh, for the Native American leadership. That is no longer there. But I also think this, and I'll be frank, I knew about for quite some time human trafficking and missing women, but I forgot until I was reading the other day how enormous it was. The fact that you can have a study come out and say 5,000. Imagine if that was in a suburb somewhere. Would that hit the news? And so your issue isn't one of just making sure I know that there is more views of what the, Afri uh, the um, Native American community is thinking of. It's got some issues. The 5,000. 5,000 missing, and not just from reservations, from cities is probably maybe even where the majority are. So I think this is what I might call almost a national security issue. And I think part of that can be by the president staying at the bully puppet and as a lectern at a press conference and bringing it up themselves. He can't mandate that the press corps has to do it, but he can mandate that they are there at the White House briefings. But I think he, it's incumbent upon him to bring them up. It's funny, on a Navy ship, if a captain walks down a whole passageway and OJ can back me up on this and turns and just looks at a bulkhead for five seconds and then walks on, four or five sailors are there cleaning it up right away. It might be clean. I feel that same way. What does that president pay attention to? And it must be here, particularly after I reread that article about 5,000 or maybe have been missing. So I get your point, sir, and that's how I would do it. Presence of me, mandate at the press conferences, but bringing it up oneself. 
Let me uh, just follow up with that, and then you can go into your closing statement. But one issue of representation that fits right into that is the federal judiciary. There's only one Native American judge in the entire federal judiciary. How would you make sure that there's better representation solving some of these complex legal issues? Yeah, I think it is incumbent upon me to make sure that those who are pushing forward recommendations has a direct link into those who come to that summit. Often, having watched in Pennsylvania how some of these nominees sometimes get in line, it has a lot sometimes to do with how much is contributed to one's campaign, and I think you're aware of that. This issue of money is enormous. Um, and you're not going to be having large campaign <laughs> contributions come. And that's incumbent on having very much like people argue about gerrymandering, have a commission. I think it has to be, and I'll take it on myself, a much more judicial objective process to have them come up. I did not know there was only one on it. Thank you. Do you want to make a closing? I'll make one closing statement. First of all, um, I appreciate the questions. I also think I learned a bit. Um, and I have somebody, if this is live stream still, somebody back living in an O'Connell Lodge, <laughs> about 50 straight days now, and uh, they're copying down the comments that I'll write down that if the Lord permits some, the president won't be forgotten. I don't give you my personal email after this on that. I don't say it lightly, joe at joesestack.com. But I'll end with this. Um, I do believe that the state of the Native American community is what it is because we were a colonial power and we fragmented uh, what was a well-governed, a well uh, managed a well, a healthy community over decades. Carlisle in Pennsylvania was the most notorious of schools of the racist attitude of where they would literally still take kids away from their parents and try to assimilate them into the wh white man's culture <laughs> by under that said, kill the Indian, save the man was the motto of the school, right where I was teaching, actually, there in Carlisle. But what I will say is this. I honestly do believe that we are always in search of the more perfect union of two wonderful characteristics, rugged individualism to try to be all one might be, but always combined with the, with the common good. I bring that up because when I it's not as applicable, but it is applicable. Because here, to the gentleman's point before I came out here, Julian, I think, said it. The military is one of the stable ways for someone to try to make his or her way out of poverty here at times. And I'll never forget when I joined the Navy, we didn't have women on ships. And then, when I was off Afghanistan, we had them find, find the most advanced fighter aircraft. And I remember when I arrived off the coast of Afghanistan to begin our strikes, and I launched eight pilots at first strike, because I wanted to go down perfectly. Seven were men who had been in the first Gulf War. They were pros from Dover. The eighth was someone we call a nugget, who had never been over a foreign country before in combat. Brand new pilot, she was about 25 years old. And she was the one who disobeyed order to that night, not to die below 20,000 feet without permission. Because we knew the Taliban had Stinger missiles from when they used to be the Mujahideen. And they were fighting the Soviet Union, so we gave them Stinger missiles that could go up about 18,000 feet to shoot down the Soviets' helicopters. And we didn't want our, my pilots to go below 20,000 feet where they might get shot. 
unless we first had a chance to clear it out. But eight special forces were ambushed. Four died immediately. And they said they're too close to laser ammunition. We've got minutes left. Somebody dive. The po male pilots asked permission. That woman pilot, that brand new one, felt she couldn't wait for permission. And risking her career as a minimum, if not her life, she dove from 20,000 feet to 3,000 three times at 0200 in the morning. And those four men picked up their dead and came home. I bring that up because we are on a journey for everyone to have an equal opportunity. Mental health, it could be almost anything here to where it is funding. But it's funding because if she hadn't gotten that opportunity, the common mission of the Navy wouldn't have succeeded better that night. We want the best of the best of all. And so these issues, to my mind, aren't just for the individual of the Native Americans. It is also for the common good of America. Because if you have healthier, less suicidal, and productive, and educated individuals with the proper funding and accountability for it, to your example, as one, we all benefit. And to me, that's the kind of approach I will take in. The money has to be accountable, but it also has to be there. And it's not just I tell people for that demographic, it's so we all benefit. Thank you very much. Thank you to our panelists and the Admiral.